Let's get our Bibles out this morning. We're in Matthew 5. I'm going to read to you verses 43 through 48. Jesus is continuing his topical messages here on Sermon on the Mount. He's speaking uh, to all different topics, and we've covered some really heavy-duty ones. Remember, these are multitudes that have followed him around for the show. They want to see, what's he going to do? What's he going to say? Is he going to do miracles? Is he going to feed people? Is he going to say something shocking, earth-shattering? And he is. He's saying a lot of heavyweight things. Remember, because he speaks to the multitudes in parables, he cloaks a lot of what he's saying because the hidden meaning was for his disciples. So if you're a disciple here today, these, uh, these words are for you from Jesus and the Holy Spirit is going to allow us to understand the meaning here. Father, we thank you this morning for the word and we ask that you would bless our ears and bless our hearts and bless our spirits that we would be able to see truth this morning. Holy Spirit, all the principles that are tucked in these verses, some of them are difficult for us to comprehend and without you they're impossible. So Holy Spirit, quicken our understanding today so that each of us would go home with a deposit of truth from the Father's heart. Don't let any of us leave here the way we came. We ask that in Jesus' name, and the church said. Amen. Jesus speaking to the multitudes, Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 34. I'm sorry, 43, a little dyslexic this morning. You have, you have heard that it is said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the just and the unjust and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Powerful words there, and some of them, if we're really listening to what Jesus is saying, should startle us a little bit. He continues uh, hitting topic after topic. We covered things like uh, restoring relational fractures and uh, divorce and adultery, heavy-duty stuff, murder. Uh, Jesus here takes the time to talk to us about our expression of love. That's what these verses 43 through 48 are really talking about, the way we express love. How many like when someone expresses love towards you? Amen. Three people. Praise God. That's good. <laughs> it's so much nicer than some of the other things people express towards us. And I'll just leave that there for a second. But since love is such a, a central theme to our Christian experience, it's natural that Jesus would care about how his people, his disciples, his followers, his children would express love. And it's important that we really look at the way we uh, express our love. Is it how the world expresses love? Is it how our culture expresses love? Or is it how the scripture tells us that we should express love? And we know that the Bible says in 1 John uh, 4, 7, and 8, some powerful things. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. It's powerful, isn't it? Listen to what else the scripture says about love. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. 1 John three fourteen. We know that we have passed from life unto death because we love the brethren. He that loves not his brother abides in death. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So love is an inescapable theme of our Christian faith. God is love. How we express love to God shows that we're his children. How we love one another proves that we're part of the family of God. So you can't be a Christian without the proper expression of love. Jesus starts his dissertation here with the phrase, you have heard. And we talked about the fact that he says that to the crowd because they're a spiritually educated crowd. Culturally, they understand these things, uh, you know, in this Greek Roman culture and the Jewish uh, influence that's there. They understood what he was saying. Most of the people 
had a common understanding of these topics, but he's about to elevate the topic. Now, it's interesting. In verse 43, you say, he says, you have heard, which means I'm going to tell you the Old Testament understanding of this topic. And in verse 43, we see a caveat here as we see God's view on the subject mixed with man's application of the subject. Now, listen to this. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those. Now, verse 43, you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, does that sound a little bit off to anybody? It should if you have a little spiritual perception. Why? Because the you shall love your neighbor, that was from God. But you shall hate your enemy, that wasn't from God. That was man's application of that. Well, I'll love, I'll love my neighbors and I'll love the people I like and I'll love the people who like me. But if you're my enemy, then I'm going to hate you. And so Jesus kind of mixes the two there together. You have heard, here's what God said, love your neighbors. And here's your application of it, but hate your enemies. Now, there's a problem there in some ways, and you say, well, how is it that love and hate were abiding in the hearts of God's people side by side for such a long time? Part of it is the fact of the Old Testament covenant and the fact that Israel was a nation that was unique among nations. If you understand Old Testament law covenant, if you understand Israel's history, God had a relationship with the nation of Israel, and all the Gentiles were on the outside of that. So it was exclusive. So for hundreds of years, God's people had been exclusive, and the law covenant didn't leave much room for grace. In fact, the way that the Jews looked at the Gentiles was that they were lost heathen dogs. And the truth was, they were lost heathen dogs. And most of us are Gentiles. So this idea of love your neighbor and hate your enemy love and hate existing side by side how is that possible you know in the old testament god told his people to avoid entire people groups entirely that you're not to eat with them you're not to fellowship with them you're not to intermarry with them you you're not to get into business with them you're to stay away from them why because there were groups that were so thoroughly evil that all and they were beyond redemption that god said if you mix with them they're going to pull you away from me and you're going to worship their gods and every time israel didn't listen to god that's exactly what happened so you have a people who separatist who are a little bit of elitists, and they believe they're special and chosen because, in fact, they are special and chosen. And now Jesus is saying, I'm dumping the whole system on its head because now I'm looking forward to the new covenant. When I die on that cross and rise again, it's going to be a whole different ball game. that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord can now be saved. Now any Jew, any Greek, any Roman, any barbarian, any heathen could call on the name of Jesus and be part of the family of God. You see, this required, this new covenant would require a new way of thinking and a new way of loving. How's your love game? Some of us need to up our love game because we're loving Old Testament style. We're going to get to this. But Jesus is telling us to love New Testament style. Now, he looks forward to the new covenant. He's like, guys, I'm going to blow the lid off thing. You're going to need a new way of thinking. You can't just love your neighbor and, you know, have a love for God and then hate your enemies. There has to be a new way of loving. He, ex he pushes the expression of love to the next level in verse 44. He says, but I say unto you. Now, think about this. The crowd's there. He's already shaking them up a little bit. He's hitting some hard topics. Verse 44 is like a sledgehammer. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Boom. Everybody's out there thinking, yeah, love, you know, the lovable people and hate your enemies. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Your enemies, I want you to love them too. And I want you to pray for them too. Wow. It's a whole paradigm shift. Now, I, I know we're New Testament people. We've been born in it. So, you know, we're not feeling that to a degree. But understand what they're feeling here today. This is radical, almost revolutionary concept that he just drops on them. And I guarantee if you were there, if we had audio from the Sermon on the Mount, it was real quiet. Okay, you probably heard like two sheep, because they couldn't get it. And that's it. Everybody else is like, what did he just say? And some people probably started moving towards the lunch line. They're like, we're done. You know, but this was a bomb here, and, and I want you to pick that up. It's a paradigm shift. He, he wants us to understand those people. Not, now, it's hard enough to love your neighbor. Can anyone just be honest in church? 
I mean, you know, you know the problem with, with loving people is people. There are some people like, man, they were not disciplined. They didn't get hugged when they were little. They didn't, and it shows, okay? And they move in next door to us, and then Jesus says, love them. Now, some people have an easier time. God bless you if you've got great neighbors, but there's one in every block, okay? So, you know, if you try and love your neighbor like the Bible says to, like yourself, huh, that's a whole other sermon. But uh, it's a hard thing. Jesus says, yeah, that's hard, but watch this. I want you to love your enemies. Now I don't want you to just love your neighbor. I want you to love the person who's categorically your enemy, who's mean to you, who's disrespectful to you, who's spiteful to you, who, who maybe doesn't want to see you uh, happy or successful. Come on, that person. I want you to love the person who does the worst possible thing to you. That's the person you've got to love. Now, just to make the concept of loving our enemies a little more real, I want to drop some of these hypothetical scenarios here today. Uh, and, and they're a little bit brutal, so hold on to your seats. But when he says love your enemy, he means love the person who maybe killed your spouse in a car accident, drunk. He means love the person who murdered your child. It's quiet now. Love the person who abused you mentally, physically, or sexually. Love the person who stole from you financially or took advantage of you and wiped you out. Love the people who took away a loved one on 9-11. Love the person who raped you. Love the person who broke their marital vow to you and love the person they broke it with. Wow. It's quiet and rightfully so because this is where the rubber hits the road on love. And Jesus says, love your enemies. And those hypotheticals will shake us to the bone because that's real life stuff right there, isn't it? This is not, you know, hey, the neighbor who took your weed whacker, let it go. This is real deep powerful stuff love your enemies now if we're being honest right now just listening to that list of hypotheticals is going to bring us to the place where we're saying to ourselves can i do this do i even have a desire to do this some people tap out right here that's it you know this is too much for me jesus um you know i i can't wrap my head around this i have too much pride for this i have too much of a, a desire to get even I, I just i can't do this and we've got to come to the place where we realize this is the crucifying of our flesh i watch a lot of crime tv shows and i like detective stories and those things and there's a lot of shows out there where you'll see someone who is in some of these scenarios where a, a, a loved one was killed by a serial killer or a spouse was murdered and they'll say something like this I've heard it time and time again and I know you have I will never forgive them for what they did wow now I get it when I see the pain and I see the loss I get it but there's a part of me as a man of God that makes my spirit cringe to realize if we choose to never forgive and to never show love, we just slam the prison door closed on ourselves. And so these are, these are harsh realities here, and this is where the rubber hits the road, but we're called to forgive as we've been forgiven. We're called to love even our enemies. You know, it's hard enough to forgive a person who, you know, maybe stepped on our toes, but what about the person who's still standing on them? You know, the person who didn't hurt you just once, but continues to hurt you. Don't look at your spouse now. Just look straight ahead. <laughs> and we got to forgive that person and show love to that person. Now, there are a few keys to having a love like this. And we we're honest. We're like, man, I don't know if I could do that. How can I do that? Do I even want to do that? There are a few keys to having this kind of love. Two of those keys are included in our text here. One is implied and the other one is listed plainly. I want to talk to you about the implied one first. If we're going to have a love like this, the first thing we have to do is we're going to have to leave our desire for vengeance and vindication in the hands of God. Im implicit in this text is the fact that if we're going to love an enemy, then we're going to have to abandon this idea of getting even. 
If we're going to love an enemy, we're going to have to uh, abandon the desire for us to be vindicated in all these issues. Do you ever see people get knee deep in an issue with someone and there's conflict and they both get so entrenched that even if they wanted to make up and shake hands, it's too late because they've already involved everyone in, in, in such a perimeter now that, I mean, even if they made up, they, they, they created the Hatfields and the McCoys. Yeah. So this idea, if I want vengeance, if I want vindication, I'm not going to be able to love an enemy. I'm going to have to abandon those things. And that's, that's implied here in the text. You say, well, what does vengeance look like? Vengeance in its simplest form is this, I'll get even. You, you got me, but I'll get even. Come on, don't look so holy at me right now. What does he mean? You know, the first thing that goes through your head when someone wrongs you. You know, I'll get even. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, oh, oh, that's the way you want to play? You want to play dirty? I can play as dirty. I can be as rough as you want to be. How low do you want to go with this? Wow. And you say, well, you know, where does that come from? Our flesh. And all of us have got it. I have Sicilian flesh. I'll send you pictures of your kids at the driveway if I don't restrain myself. I'm telling you, it's amazing. Some of you are like, what is he talking about? That, that's, how, that's how much flesh. Like, we got to deal with that stuff, right? right. Oh, are you going to do that to my wife? You're going to do that to my kid? Now it's quiet. And God says, you know what? This idea of you getting back has got to go. Because the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Oh, we hate that verse. You know, my friend used to say, if you just move the punctuation around, vengeance is mine. The Lord said it. <laughs> but you can't. Because the minute you're hell-bent on getting back and threatening or being, you know, sinking in the mud, if you want to go eye for an eye, you, you get into this place where now you don't represent the kingdom of God anymore. Because <laughs> we're not acting like the king. We're acting more like the devil. So vengeance has got to go, well, what about vindication? Well, I'll expose them. They want, to, they want to expose me. I'll expose them. I want them to look bad. I want them to be embarrassed publicly. I want to humiliate them, and at the same time, I want to be completely exonerated of any wrongdoing. That's what, now, there again, this is how people feel in their heart. This is how we felt. Uh, well, you know what? Well, maybe I was only 2% wrong, but I, I want to cover that up. But you're the, where you were wrong, I want to completely expose that. And I want to be vindicated. I want to look good, and I want you to look bad. Do you realize how exhausting that is in life to have to try and effectuate that with your time and your energy? It's got to go. Vengeance belongs to the Lord, and we have to trust the Lord enough for him to mete out justice and to let that rest squarely on his shoulders and in his hands. If we want vengeance, if we want to get even, if we want to look good, and we want to make others look bad, we're not going to be able to love our enemies. Number two, that was what was implied in the text. What it plainly says is this, to love like this, we're going to have to learn to pray for our enemies. Yeah, this is about how it went over in first service. <laughs> pray for my enemies? Do you mean P-R-E-Y, pray on my enemies? <laughs> no, pray for your enemies. There again, uh, to love someone who's categorically seen as an enemy is something that, you know, it's, it's counterintuitive. It's, it's Jesus asking us to do something that's, you know, just beyond comprehension in a way but he says you know here you're going to have to learn to pray for him now it's no accident that Jesus includes a command to pray for an enemy as a precursor to loving them because it's not oh you know he just threw that in there because it sounded spiritual no it's a spiritual key prayer does some things that only prayer can do when we're willing to pray for an enemy, we're, uh, uh, things are about to change. L listen, when you pray for an enemy, it lifts the matter out of the earthly realm into the heavenly realm. Then we can get God's perspective on it. Have you ever been in a mess and you, 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 you shop it around to everybody and everybody has the same view? Oh, yeah, you were wrong. You were wrong. They, they, they deserve it. You know, and man agrees, but then you lift it up to God and he shows you a different perspective. 
When you pray for an enemy, it lifts it out of the muck and mire of earth and it brings it into the heavenly realm. And then we can get God's view on it. And I've noticed many times, once I get God's view on it, my heart begins to change. So prayer does some things that only prayer can do. Prayer lets us exchange our broken, angry heart for the heart of God. They abused me. They took advantage of me. They should have nurtured me. They said miserable things to me and did miserable things to me. God, how can I forgive that? Call their name before the throne of grace. Begin to pray for them. And God will do some things in your heart. Here's the bottom line on the power of prayer. It's hard to hate hate a person once you've invested prayer in them. I guarantee you think the, the person that is flashing through your mind right now as I'm preaching. When we're done, you go home, you get in your prayer closet, you turn everything off, and you begin to pray for them. And I guarantee, once you invest some prayer in them, your heart towards them is going to change. It's hard to hate a person you've prayed for. Number two, it's hard to hate a person that you can now see through God's eyes. Do you know what? Hurt people hurt people. The reason some people were so hurtful to some of us is because somebody hurt them. And because somebody hurt them, they just reciprocated. They took it out on us. No, we didn't deserve it, but neither did they. Do you see the way the chain works here? And so when we begin to see someone through God's eyes, well, they're just hurt. They're just broken. They, they were abused. They, they were mistreated. When, when God begins to show us that, see, we don't know these things until we get into place of prayer. And then the Holy Spirit shows us that person's life, that person's heart, what they've been through. And sometimes our little journey just f- fades in comparison. I mean, I haven't been through half of that. Then instead of anger, we begin to feel compassion towards them. Wow, this is what prayer does, church. I know it's a hard thing to be asked to pray for your enemy, but prayer, uh, it's hard to hate a person you pray for. It's hard to hate a person who you can now see through God's eyes. And it's hard to hate a person who needs the same forgiveness that you and I have received. (laughs) So once the hate's gone, then we can begin to love them. But if we won't let go of the hate, if we'll demand our pound of flesh, if we want vengeance and vindication and we're not willing to wait for God, we're never going to love an enemy. Now, if we'll pray, God will change our heart. If we'll trust him uh, for justice, for vengeance, for vindication, God will work all of that out. We won't have to change the, we won't have to carry the burden around. So there again, these are hard things to do that Jesus is asking, but they are possible through the Holy Spirit and the effect that it will have on our lives and the lives around us is immeasurable. Verse 45 kind of shifts gears a little bit, and God just reminds us that he himself does exactly what he's asking us to do. Isn't it nice that God doesn't ask us to do things he's unwilling to do? He doesn't say, you love people when they're mean to you, but I'm going to pour my wrath out on anybody who messes with me. No, God has mercy on people. God is loving towards people who don't love him. Can I get an amen? Amen. Look what it says here. So that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven, for he causes his son to rise on the just and the unjust and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. So what he's saying here is, I'm not asking you to do anything that I don't do. And that's a good thing. You know, Jesus modeled for us how we're supposed to behave, what we're supposed to do. God, our Father in heaven, has always allowed the sun and the rain (coughs) to fall on the just and the unjust. He waters the crops of the the man who hates God, who's an atheist, who refuses to acknowledge God. And he causes growth and prosperity. He He feeds all people. He doesn't say, you know what, I'm only taking care of my own here and everybody else is cut off and... No, he pours out mercy on uh, some of us. He's poured out mercy for decades while we were estranged from him and had no relationship with him while we chased the things of the world. And he was good to us. He kept us. He kept us alive when some of us. I mean, some of us, you think about how many times we could have literally been dead. Doing crazy stuff in the streets. Yet you're here today. Breathing God's grace in, saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, a child of God. Your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life because he's been good to us. 
He's been patient with us. So God says, yeah, I know what they did to you, and I'll, 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 I'll bring justice to that, but you extend grace and love because that's what I do. And so he, he's telling us, be like me. I pour out my, my love and my mercy on people and on people who ignore me. Think about all the people who ignore God and think they're blessed and successful and pockets are full of money and their houses are nice and they drive a nice car because of their own grit and strength and hard work. And it's God's grace that fills the next breath in their lungs. God loves people who reject him, who deny him, people who say he's not there, he's not real, people who provoke him, who mock him, who oppose him and persecute his children. God is good to them in the hopes that if they could just see his goodness, they'd repent and have a relationship with him. We need to remember one thing before I move on from this point. All of us at one time were enemies of God. Now, some people have a hard time admitting that. No, I was always a good person. I was born, yeah, I was born full of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, and I never. All of us had to come to a place where we got born again. And what do we have to get born again from? Our old nature, because spiritually we were dead and estranged from God. And we came to this place and we said, I'm lost. I'm a sinner. I need a savior. And Jesus goes, yoo-hoo. Ha. And then what happened? We were born again. And God saved us and he cleansed us and he filled us with his spirit and he calls us his own. But understand, to that point, up to that point, we were enemies of God. Romans 5.10 says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Colossians 1.21, and although we were formerly alienated, enemies, and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless beyond reproach. Wow. Wow. Way to go, Jesus. <laughs> while I was unlovable, while I was a sinner, while I was estranged from God, while I was busy doing evil things, while I was ignoring God, you loved me and you were patient with me and you gave me chance after chance. When I was an enemy of God, now you've reconciled me to the Father and made me one of his very own. Verse 46 and 47 provide two examples. Jesus gives a few illustrations here. He's saying if your love game is like the world's, you know what? Uh, here's what it looks like. There's two examples here, and th what they're showing is this is the shallow expression of love that the world puts out there. And it's unbecoming for a Christian to love like this. He says in 46, for if you love those who love you, come on, isn't that the way the world does it? If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Wow, that was a big ouch right there. Tax collectors were like the, the worst people back then. Nobody liked the tax collector. You know why? Because the tax collectors were little weasels. They would come to your place. They would take extra taxes, put it in their own pockets. They didn't pay their fair share. Come on. It sounds like uh, some of the politicians we have. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. He says, even the tax collectors do that. And there again, we got no audio, but everybody went, ooh. Verse 47, if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? So he's saying, you know, if you love like the world loves, you're no better than a tax collector. You're no better than a heathen. And, uh, you know, doesn't, don't the Gentiles do the same? Uh, you know, it's unbecoming for a child of God to love like the world loves. Now, all of us have heard stuff like this, and people have said it, and maybe we've even said it with our own lips at times. But how many times have we heard people say, well, you know, I'm nice to people who are... Shout it out when you know it. I'm generous to those who are... Well, you're doing good. I'm kind to people if they're... I'm respectful to those who show respect. That's how the world loves. So basically, I love people who love me. And if you don't love me, if you're not nice to me, if you're not generous, if you're not kind, if you're not respectful, then you can expect that from me. 
Jesus is saying, if that's where you're at, that's unbecoming for a Christian. He says, if that's where your love game is at, you're a lightweight lover. You need to up your love game because that's not the way God loves. And so if we have an attitude like this, we should consider Romans 5.8. But God demonstrated his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How does that juxtapose with the person who says, well, I'm nice to you if you're nice to me? Did Jesus go, well, I, I, I'll die for you if you would die for me? Or, or, or I'll take care of your sin if you stop sinning? Now it's quiet. Because while I was yet a sinner, Jesus said, well, in your worst condition, Rick, at your worst moment, in the darkest moment of your life, in your worst sin, I'll die for you right there. Come on, Full Gospel Center. I want you to feel this a little bit. Shallow expressions of love are not helpful uh, to us showing the world that Jesus Christ lives in our heart. If we're only loving to the people who love us, who are nice to us, who are generous to us, who are respectful to us. Oh, I'm respectful to people. Do you see how shallow that is? It's petty. And it's not a reflection how God has loved us. Verse 48 brings it in for a landing, and there's kind of a little bit of a twist here. Remember, Jesus is talking to multitudes. He's just flipped this whole idea of how to express love on its head. He's told them not just to love people who love you, but love people who are categorically your enemies. The people are still re reeling. <coughs> so what does he do? He finishes up with this. Listen to this. Therefore, you are to be perfect, say it, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, he just told us to love people we didn't want to love. He just pretty much told us if we were unwilling to love the unlovable, we were like tax collectors and heathen. And he says, let me cap this off with telling you, you need to be perfect. Or is that really what he's saying there? Let's take a look. To the perfectionist, this is their favorite misquoted, misunderstood verse. When a perfectionist reads verse 48, they say, see, I knew it. I'm supposed to be perfect. I'm supposed to do everything right. I'm supposed to, and if I don't, I better hide it because I don't want people to know. Come on, second service, you alive out there? Are you buying what I'm selling or are you trying to be perfect? No, good, I can tell you. Yeah, okay. Perfectionists love to take a verse like this and, and, and take it out of its context and not really understand it. And he's saying, you know, they're thinking, yeah, we're supposed to be perfect, and we got to do everything right, and if we don't, we need to hide it, and that's really not what he's saying. And let me just tell you something. Perfection is not possible. Most of us who are over a certain age in life, where you know the age where you start to, you're not going uphill anymore. You're starting to go downhill. Can I, you, the things you used to be able to do. I remember playing softball, sitting in a position, and a ball's rocketed in the gap, and I'm thinking, yeah, 20 years ago, I would get that, and this, now I don't even flinch. <laughs> no way. There ain't not enough Ben Gay in the world to make me get to that ball, <laughs> right? So when, you start, when you're on the downhill side, you realize you're not perfect, and you don't even have a shot at trying to be anymore. Okay, so this is not about perfectionism in the world's understanding of it, but this, it's, it's about this. This verse is all about focus. Whose image of perfection are we aiming for? Are we aiming for what the world says is perfection, which is really just an illusion, or are we aiming for God's view of perfection? You see, listen to this. If you're a Christian today, if you confess your sin and accept Jesus, in God's sight, you're perfect. Now, I'm going to say it again for all of you who are going, no, no, not me. Everybody else, but not me, Pastor. No, if you've accepted Jesus today and you're in Christ, you're perfect. And here's why. Listen to me. Because God looks at you and he looks at you covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why he's trying to up the level of our conduct here. So our conduct matches who we are positionally in Christ. When Jesus looks at Rick, he doesn't look at all the failures and the flaws and the, the shortcomings. He looks and he sees, oh, I see Jesus. I see the blood. I see perfection. This guy's my kid. And he says that about you too. So positionally, we're perfect already because of what Jesus has done in our place. But in, in our own you know, personal 
holiness, in our own personal outworking, there's always room for improvement. So what do we shoot for? We shoot to be conformed to the image of Christ. That every day I'm beginning to act a little bit more like Jesus than the way Rick wants to act. And we've already let a few clues out on how that goes. That, you know, the flesh needs to be crucified so that we can be more like Christ. So this is not about perfectionism in the world's understanding of it. This is about how we focus and what we aim at. Are we aiming to be more like Jesus every day? Or are we just saying, hey, this is it. This is the best. This is the most I want to try. Uh, you know, ta-da. It's all about focus. It's all about your spiritual aim. Spiritually, what are you aiming at? You know the word sin is an archery term. It means to miss the mark. When you would miss the, the mark on the target, the bullseye, did you ever see you know, an archery target with the big circles, the big rings? You know why there are all the rings on there? Because that one in the middle is probably the safest spot because you barely ever hit that. But it's all, you know, we miss, we miss. It's, to sin is to miss the mark. So it's not about perfection, but it's about what we're aiming at. Do we, do we aim for the mark? Do we aim for the bullseye? Absolutely. What is it? It's to be like Jesus. And so, uh, you know, what we aim at is important. Let me say two things about your spiritual aim and then close with the scripture and, and we'll be done. Two things about our spiritual aim. Number one, if you aim at nothing spiritually, you'll hit it every time. What are your spiritual aims? Well, I just want to, you know, kind of go through life like a bull in the china closet and hopefully make it to heaven. Is that what you're aiming at? Come on, that's way lower than what God has for you. Are you aiming at Jesus? Are you allowing the Holy Spirit to conform you into the image of Christ? Are you letting iron sharpen iron? Are you allowing your character? Are you willing to be repentive? Are you willing to say, I was wrong? Or you cloaked in that world perfection. I can't, I can't admit that I'm wrong. I gotta pretend, I gotta spin it, I gotta create an image. What are you aiming at today? If you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. And number two, if you aim at the target, if you aim at the the mark, you're gonna hit close to it. You're not gonna get perfect, but you're gonna get a lot closer to it than if you aim at nothing at all. If you and I will wake up every day and say, Holy Spirit, today I'm yours. I'm clay on the potter's wheel. Conform me and make me into the image of Jesus. I have no agenda today, God, but to please you and allow myself to be more like Christ. If we'll wake up and do that every day, I guarantee at the end of our lives we'll be a lot closer to what we're supposed to be than what we are right now. So this perfection that Jesus speaks of maybe was just to rock the crowd just a little bit more. But for you and I who are his disciples, we understand it's about focus. It's about aim. It's about wanting to be more like Jesus than we were yesterday. And Philippians 3, 12 through 14. Not that I have obtained it already or have become perfect, the apostle Paul speaking, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's bow our heads today. Father, I realize that... These words that Jesus gave to us are not easy words. They're meat, and sometimes it's hard to chew and it's hard to digest. And Father, it's hard to love our enemies. It's hard to love those who have done some of the most outlandish things to us. It's hard to forgive those who have abused us in ways that we don't even really want to talk about or think about anymore. But Father, I pray that each of us would find forgiveness in our hearts, would find grace to forgive because we've been forgiven, that we'd be willing to up our love game, that we wouldn't love shallow like the world does, but we'd begin to love like our Father in heaven does, who while we were yet sinners, sent his only son to die for us, who while we were enemies of God, engineered a way to reconcile us to himself. What a, what a beautiful miracle you've done 
through the cross of Calvary, and we are the beneficiaries. Help us to be lovers in a world that refuses this kind of love. Let it show from those who call themselves the people of God. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.